What do we mean by a shape of an alarm? When you spend enough time on a landscape and you listen and you watch behaviors, you'll start to notice that bird behavior that indicates the presence of a predator, for instance, doesn't happen in a random form. It always has a shape. It always has a, a kind of a personality to it. And they're, each different personality is, is uh, unique enough that you can literally learn to tell them apart. They're not quite as easy as saying, that's a pigeon and that's a crow, but you can definitely recognize things like, that's definitely a nest robber. Um, you know, you don't know, for instance, if it's going to be a raven or if it's going to be a crow, uh, but you know it's a nest robber and you know it immediately. So it is that accurate. Um, enough time and experience in one place and you can get pretty darn good at, at, at accurately figuring out what shape means what species pretty much exactly. And that has to do with experience in a place, not just the shapes. So combine what you know about the five voices with what you're going to learn about the shapes and get to know your area that you like to sit and you'll soon find yourself uh, surprised at how much you actually can tell from what's going on from these shapes. When you're looking for shapes of alarm, the first thing you're going to want to do is tune into the background context of your landscape. You're going to want to look at the, a landscape and become familiar with it, and you're, going to, and you're going to want to know where are the food sources right now? Where would I experience feeding birds? Um, where would I experience birds nesting? Where might I experience uh, birds hiding for cover? Um, where might an animal trail move through a landscape? Like here where I'm sitting now, there's a, there's a thicket down below me where a creek is moving through. There's an open meadow over here. There's tall trees over here. They all have different contextual uh, patterns to them that will influence what we're about to talk about. You know? And if everything was exactly the same on the landscape, uh, shapes would be easier to identify, of course, because uh, everything would be exactly the same and anything that moved around would cause a very distinct pattern. So you have to account for both the baseline diversity and the baseline behaviors before you actually start to see the shapes. So here's the first shape. Uh, this is the shape that you don't ever want to cause again. <laughs> uh, imagine you've been sitting at your sit spot 10 days in a row for an hour each time and you've gotten to know that place pretty well. Over there there's some spotted toeys, over here there's usually juncos feeding, uh, over here some song sparrows like to go up into that one shrub, I see some robins over there, uh, everyone seems happy. Then one day you're sitting at your sit spot and you notice robins flying suddenly and directly over your head and you're like, whoa, what's your hurry? Where are you going? And then you see the song sparrows fly by and you notice other birds kind of shooting this way and you're like, huh, I wonder what that's about. And then you're sitting there and two minutes or so later, all of a sudden you start to hear sounds over there and you look and you crane your neck. Oh, it's my neighbor walking briskly towards my house. She looks like she's mad again about something. That's a bird plow. Um, literally, you don't want to um, make that shape. That's the shape that basically says the birds are fearing your approach for some reason. It, when I first saw that shape with, with people walking briskly, and by the way, that, with, that brisk walk I'm talking about is a normal walk. If you're downtown Portland or Seattle or uh, Newark, New Jersey, you're going to see everybody in that walk. So don't look for some strange, you know, aberrant hunting behavior. We're talking about what modern people just call normal walking. It's not a stroll, it's, a, it's your brisk walk, the one that's used on the sidewalk. Uh, that particular walk going A to, a to Z in a, in a straight line, in a direct line, creates what we call a bird plow. Now there's, there's other forms of bird plows. A bird plow basically means a source of energy birds scattering. You know, this source of energy could be an approaching occipiter causing the birds to scatter in a particular way, and we'll talk about that. It has a particular shape to it. Or it could be a person walking briskly, scaring the birds. Um, I used to think in the beginning that there must be something really terrible about us. You know, we must be like holding really bad thoughts or something, because why would birds be so afraid of a person walking? It makes no sense, because it's not like you see the neighbor coming and throwing sticks at birds. She's not actually angry at the birds. Then I came to understand with enough observation and enough experience that a person walking briskly in a landscape often causes a cooper's hawk to follow from behind or a sharpshin hawk to come in from behind. 
and this was observed in the Presidio in San Francisco, a jogger with uh, you know, some headphones on jogging and a sharp chin hawk following the jogger and taking advantage of the bird plow they're creating. Similar to the way uh, a dolphin you know, will follow the wake of a, of a ship and get the fish that are, are disoriented off the bow wake. So maybe the bird plow is more of a concern on the bird's part, not that there's a cooper's hawk coming with every person that's walking up, but here comes another person walking in that way that seems to always attract that cooper's hawk. So birds are getting out of there just in case. I really haven't figured out why. Maybe you can. But let's put it this way. The bird plow is not a compliment from the bird's point of view. My favorite of all alarms is the sentinel. It's the most common and it's the most commonly misconstrued. Uh, when you're sitting at your sit spot, you'll see three or four birds all parked up in the trees looking in that direction. And people will almost always in the beginning say, oh yeah, there are some birds resting during the second period of the sit. And I'll say, birds resting? What do you mean? Well, they were just kind of sitting up in the open and they were all just kind of sitting there. Were they looking in the same direction? Yeah, they were actually. Huh. Were they all fluffed up and kind of preening? Oh, no, no, they were sitting really still. Hmm. That's actually an alarm. That's not a baseline behavior. Well, they don't look alarmed. No, they're, they're being still and quiet, but they're definitely paying attention. It would be like, you know, you and I are having a conversation and suddenly we hear, you know, the, the, uh, the under-throated growl of a leopard moving through the thicket, right? So you and I will stop talking and we'll go like this. for as long as it takes. <laughs> That's sentinel, basically. Uh, it's a form of stillness and watching. And it, it, it has a look to it. You know, the birds are flying towards something they're curious about, landing at a high position and looking towards alarm. One thing to know about sentinel, which I really, really love, is that often behind a sentinel, from the bird's butt behind it, is where baseline often is. And the reason that's so is because if I'm a song sparrow and I have a cooper's hawk in my neighborhood and I don't quite know where that cooper's hawk is right now, I don't feel comfortable feeding out in the open. So I'll have to feed in the thicket over here. But there's some good insects to grab right over there. But I can't get to them right now because it's too risky to go out in the open. But all of a sudden the scrub jay comes in and lands and goes in a sentinel position over here and looks that way. I'm like, oh cool. He knows where the cooper's hawk is. He's watching. He's got my back, so to speak. Now I go behind his back and feed. Uh, so you'll often hear songs just behind Sentinel. You'll see maintenance behavior just behind Sentinel. It's not always, but you'll often see that. So you can say in some ways that a Sentinel could represent the edge of an alarm. And behind the edge of the alarm begins the baseline pattern. But once again, there's no rules in bird language. There's patterns and principles. But there's no hard and fast rules. But watch for that pattern. Well, here's a peculiar thing that happens to people, and boy, don't they wish it was true. I'm sitting in my, my sit spot here. Been here for five days now in a row, feeling pretty good about myself. I've been going to my sit spot for a month and a half. I'm starting to really get there, I'm think, telling myself. And I know it's true because there's all these juncos feeding very close to me. And in fact, not just juncos, I'm particularly proud because right over there under the picnic table in my yard, Right while I'm sitting here is that usually shy toey feeding right there where I can see it. John goes here, toey there. Huh, look at that song sparrow down under the thicket right there ne next to me. I must be getting pretty spiritual because these birds are coming awfully close to me. We, we hear that one a lot, especially in the beginning of uh, people's bird language uh, experience. Often what that means is there's a cooper's hawk in the tree right over there. And these birds haven't been able to eat for hours and so they see you sitting there and they're like, perfect. Let's go feed by him because we know the Cooper's Hawk doesn't like to come close to people. We call this safety barrier. And safety barrier, kind of like sentinel, is a commonly misinterpreted behavior. When you think birds are being uh, awful friendly and, and they're feeding out in the open or close to you, ask the question of yourself, are they under things? So for instance, under cars or under the branches of an overhanging bush. Um, that's often an indication that they, they're telling you that the danger is up and above. They're letting you see them, but they're not letting someone over there see them, you know, up and above. So ask yourself also, is it really quiet right now all around me? And the only th 
baseline behavior I see is right next to me. You know, that's, that's how you recognize this safety barrier. It shows up in a lot of different ways. It isn't just uh, with people sitting at their sit spot. You'll see other, other forms of safety barrier. Pay attention for that. More common than the tunnel of silence is what we call the zone of oppression. And the zone of oppression is often accompanying that sentinel behavior we talked about earlier. A Cooper's hawk who's hunting sneaks into an area, lands in this dug fir tree right here. You can't really see it from anywhere down on the ground. The whole place goes silent. And there's a pillow of silence. We call it a pillow of silence or a zone of oppression, kind of spherical shape on the landscape where no bird sound can be heard. This is a common shape. And it's often more common than you realize because in most city parks or in suburban neighborhoods, there's always a Cooper's hawk around. So on a 10 a.m. April morning on a beautiful day with no wind, there should be a lot of bird song, there should be a lot of bass line. There's nothing. The place is silent. And in the distance, you can hear alarms over here. And you can see sentinel birds over here looking in this direction. They're looking at a hawk somewhere in here that you can't see. That's actually more common than you realize. Watch for that one. We call it the, the zone of oppression. Let's look at a weasel alarm for a second. With a cat, you have a slowly moving parabolic for a hunting cat. For a snake or a nest robber or an owl, you have a static parabolic. It sits in one place. For a weasel, what you have is a sudden burst of parabolic energy that's very excited, and then it stops. And then it shows up again over here with a lot of excitement, and then it stops. And then it shows up over here, and then it's back over here. And then there's periods in between. So it's an interrupted parabolic with a lot more excitement. That's because weasels appear, disappear, appear and disappear. When the weasel is visible to the birds, they form that parabolic that's excited because they see it, they're telling everybody about it, and they're also afraid it's going to disappear any second, which it does. When it disappears, they look around nervously. They fly from place to place. Sometimes they'll change positions so they're not taken from behind or something like that. Weasels will often show up here, then show up there, and then show up here again, just to kind of mess with the birds, I think. Weasels are definitely more common than people realize, and they're often more prevalent on a landscape. And it's often that bird alarm that tells you weasels are around long before you see your first weasel. So just because you've never seen a weasel doesn't mean they're not, they're not there. Uh, that particular alarm shape uh, is usually indicative that a weasel is in your landscape. When people first begin learning bird language, they report that uh, it's all just confusing. There's just noise, and there's just too much going on, and there's too many sounds, and I don't know what's happening. And uh, That's how it feels in the beginning. But just you know, bear with that pattern, and by visiting the same place over and over again, you'll begin to get to know the individuals who live there, and you'll get to know their baseline patterns. And that becomes the foundation for understanding and seeing the shapes pop out, if you will. Okay, so. Be patient, give yourself some time, and, and be, be out there regularly, and, and, you'll, and you'll, uh, you'll eventually get to see this stuff for yourself.